Hello folks, good afternoon and welcome to the webinar on future of work and workplace organized by Times Ascent. My name is Pancham Dogra and I will be the moderator of this uh, webinar today. So the whole question about the future of work and workplace is about why are we talking about it? Of course, uh, if you if you go back and look at the last uh, six odd months, everyone is talking about the future of work. Future of work has been in uh, in conversation for the last three, four years, actually, from HR's point of view. But in the last six months, it has got accelerated quite a bit. Now, the question is, what has accelerated? And we all know that we have all started working from home now. Uh, uh, we have seen a pandemic that people call unprecedented. Yet, when you actually go back and study, uh, we realize that this was not the first time we were faced with a situation like this. We don't have to go a century behind where the, the Spanish flu uh, actually brought down around 50 million people. But if you look back and look at the last two decades, we had SARS in 2001, 2002. And in the next, next six to seven years, we had swine flu, we had bird flu, then we had MERS, which is Middle East uh, virus, and then we had Ebola, which actually was as, as uh, 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 latest as 2016, 17. And then in 2020, we had something called COVID. Actually, 2019, we had something called COVID, which started. So what it tells us very simply is that it's not that we were not warned about it. And a lot of people are talking about COVID as a black swan event. When if, for those of us who know what black swan is, it is an event that is unprecedented and it has something that has never happened. The question is, is it a black swan event? The answer is no, because something like this has already happened. Yet organizations had not seen how we could prepare ourselves very quickly and how we could reorganize ourselves, how we can rework our business models to make sure that we start living in the new normal, as we say. Now, the question is, what is the new normal? Like as Heraclitus said, nobody steps into the same river twice. The fact is that every day is a new normal. And events like COVID and Ebola and MERS these are only those events which trigger acceleration. Now, therefore, the question that we have to ask, and in fact, interestingly, uh, on January 26th, Talib had published a paper where he talked about the fact that coronavirus is going to spread across the globe in a non-linear way because of the fact that people are traveling across the globe. Nobody paid attention to what he said. And two months later, by the time the world woke up to what he had talked about, it was too late. And, and we are all actually looking at an unprecedented event in that sense. The question therefore is, are we able to predict some of the events? The answer is yes. The problem is, are we able to accept it in time? Number one. And number two, are we able to do something about it in time? The answer is not sure. And today's session actually is about that, that future of work is, are, is happening every day. But can we anticipate some big trends, number one, and can we prepare for it in advance so that over a period of time, we don't, you know, we, we're not surprised or we're not taken aback by a surprising event that completely erodes everything that we have worked for. And that is the question that we want to ask an answer to. So what we are talking about today is the challenge that we are in front of us will not only be about predicting the event, but it is also about how do we predict the event yet become anti-fragile? How do we adapt to rapidly changing conditions at the speed of at which the conditions are changing? How organizations will have to actually learn to look at new roles which are emerging out of these rapidly changing conditions and how new activities will become prominent and how do we match the existing workforce to the new demands of roles? And more importantly, how do we make sure that the existing workforce can be reskilled and upskilled continuously to make sure that we continue to deliver results in the post pandemic? And that is exactly what we will talk about. How we are going to structure this session today is that we will make it very interactive. And at this point, what I would request you to do is take a pause, uh, open another tab on your browsers or if you have a smartphone you can log into www.menti.com we will give you further instructions as the session progresses but the idea is that we will continue to make this session highly interactive what we will do is we will make sure that we share with you not only what is happening around the globe in terms of big events but we will share with you what some of us are actually doing in this in our respective organizations to to look at how future is going to look like and how we will make sure that 
um, uh, we are prepared for it. The third thing, which is very critical, like I said, it is interactive. So interactivity is not only about polls, but interactivity is also about the fact that, you know, you need to ask questions so that we, we know what you're thinking about. Because the questions you ask will actually trigger the kind of conversations that we would want to have. So please feel free to ask as many questions. What we will do is we will spend the last 15 minutes of the session in trying to answer the questions that have not already been answered during the session. With that thought, what I want to do is I want to quickly introduce to you our speakers. The first panelist that I want to introduce to you is Dr. Ankita Singh, Senior Vice President and Global Head of HR in Cygnex Datamatics. Dr. Ankita has more than 19 years of progressive experience in managing and leading various aspects of HR, spanning across quite diverse situations and high performance and highly dynamic domains of ITES. Now, Dr. Ankita has excelled in establishing innovative and competitive initiatives. She has been able to institutionalize a strong performance driven culture at Cygnex, so much so that in the last four years continuously, Signex has been identified as a great place to work. In fact, one of the other interesting things about Dr. Ankita is that she is also amongst one of India's top 100 great people managers. So Ankita, if you can quickly um, switch on your uh, webcam and say hi to everybody, it'll be great. Thank you. Thank you, Pancham, for the lovely introduction. I have already done that. Hi, everyone. Looking forward to our amazing session forward. Thank you. Thank you, Ankita. So let me move to our second panelist, Ms. Neeru Mehta. Neeru is the Vice President and of People Development and Learning in Global Logic. She has more than 20 years of diverse corporate experience and actually interesting experience because she has done not only leadership roles and global COE leadership, COE leadership roles, but she has also seen transformations and MA leadership. She is a certified life and leadership coach, and she has a keen interest in leadership and transition coaching. Well, welcome, Neeru. If you can quickly say hi to everybody, it'll be great. Yeah, thank you, uh, Pancham. Uh, uh, and, you know, again, uh, thank you for uh, really sharing uh, the context uh, of the whole session so beautifully and, uh, you know, talking about the events that are happening. I'm really looking forward to you know, for all of us to discuss some of these uh, aspects with the audiences today. Thank you, Neeru. And our next panelist is Mr. Augustus Azaria. He is Associate Director, Human Resources in IBM. Well, Augustus has more than 25 years of experience in HR. He is passionate about people development. In fact, interestingly, he has spent more than two decades in IBM. So you can call him almost a lifer at IBM. And and Augustus has a very august vision of future of work in fact he sees a future where political boundaries will no longer be there there will be very blurred boundaries and talent will actually become universal in this true sense and we sincerely hope that it happens sooner than later and 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 augustus is highly interested in the topic of the future of work and we hope to learn a lot from his expertise and insights in the area so augustus i'm inviting you to say hi so thank you, Pancham, for having me here this afternoon and uh, truly delighted to be here and uh, also to uh, share stage with uh, Neeru and Dr. Ankita and a fantastic topic, very relevant uh, and very insightful. And I'm sure it's going to be a very interactive uh, Friday afternoon. Thank you. Thank you again. Sure. Thank you, Augustus. So audiences, now we are coming back to you quickly. What we want to do is ask you again to go to www.menti.com and type the beating number that is given there 3022632 once you do that i will quickly walk you through to mentimeter and then we'll get started okay so the poll i can see that six people have already logged into mentimeter so the question that i'm asking everybody is how has work from home due to covid impacted your productivity and I can see that eight people have already logged in and they've already answered. So we'll wait for a couple of other people. Let's see what people are saying. Okay, the trend is interesting actually. Okay, I see some people now, the decreased piece has started to see some traction and that's interesting actually. Majority still say that it's increased, okay. Folks, let's take the next one, next one minute to close the poll before we 
start discussing the findings. So we have 21 people who have voted, but we have more than 40 attendees. So this, this doesn't look like a very exciting participation rate. For it to become successful, my request would be for all of us to actually participate in some of these surveys and activities because the whole idea is to draw insights from your experiences also. So I'm hoping that we are able to touch 25. Okay, 25 we have done. Good, not bad. So 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 I think I think it's time that we um, uh, just stop this because uh, we, people are taking time. It appears. So, so panelists, uh, uh, I would request you to stay with this for a minute. Uh, these results. So, what? So, around 65, overwhelming majority says that their productivity has increased. That's one. Uh, the second is actually uh, uh, so there is there is it, almost one third of the people who are actually saying that the productivity has gone down. Now we will follow this with another po another poll question, and then we'll start the conversation around this. So, participants, there is a next question follow up question for all of you so panelists this is actually an interesting observation this is completely skewed to one side so what i would request you to do is as, as the results come in just think about the first one and the second question and, and and what i would want you to do is think about how these two are related to each other so we'll wait to hit the 25 mark and then we will start this okay so while we wait for more so i think we should start the conversation so, so, so panelists, I'll, I'll ask you one by one, uh, looking at the, these two results, uh, what is it that comes to your mind? One, the people are saying that the productivity has in increased, number one. And number two, they're saying that the greatest challenge in working from home has been that personal time and work time boundaries are blurred. So there is no perceived break. So Ankita, your views on this, these two questions? Yeah, thank you. I think uh, yes, that's that's one thing which uh, we all are going through. Um, you know, earlier we used to talk about work-life balance, and now we see that we have made that swift uh, shift towards work-life integration. Because obviously there are, I would not say it's getting blurred. Actually, there's no line. There's no line that differentiates. So you are on a call, and suddenly you will get called by somebody, you know, from back, and you will have to react. There is no possible way of ignoring any of these two things so work and uh, life at home is is probably working together and that's how it is going to be i think uh, people who uh, said that they are able to work really well uh, probably because it's more about intention self discipline and finding that balance or uh, perfect integration between these two and that's the reason uh, probably they would have defined a well structure for themselves that this is the time um, when I'll be working and this is the time when I'll be sitting with my um, you know folks at home but at the same time acceptance and embracing the reality that not everything will be as per the set schedule so like when we talk about covid when we talk about wuka world we talk about impact of technology one thing we have always learned and one thing we have always followed followed is being adaptable in all our approaches so we keep changing and as you rightly said initially we are just getting ready for the new normal and i think now the definition of new also has completely changed. It is just the next normal. Every next day is a next normal. There is nothing new which is staying new for more than a day or probably a couple of days. So yes, I think quite relatable. The first one is very valid. People, most of the people find it more uh, relevant being at home and they think that they are more productive. And at the same time, the only disturbance and i would not say disturbance only thing that they are trying to manage or they have successfully managed is the integration part so yeah, yeah that's that's my take on it thank you ankita so augustus now i'll defer uh, uh, what ankita said uh, coming out of that is a threat to you uh, the threat is that you know see when we talk about increased productivity and then people are saying, uh, saying that you know personal time and work time boundaries are blurred one can simply assume that uh, people are working longer hours therefore um, uh, and 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 people are maybe able to integrate work and uh, personal time uh, having said that uh, there there are there are concerns around burnout that start emerging the moment we see these two questions uh, so what's your take on whether this is sustainable or not number one and number two 
how do we make sure that this productivity level increase that people talk about it never drops okay good question uh, thank you pancham um, so uh, coming to the first part of it okay uh, taking a few uh, thread from uh, dr kankita is is this uh, see what has happened now is uh, an always on mentality right there is earlier you know i could shut down my laptop get into my car drive home use my me time and you know there is a break basically right but here it doesn't happen that way the always on syndrome continues at home all right and and needless to say you are seeing that people are more productive what has also happened is that we are seeing that learning has also gone up by 20 30% okay so which means that what power that productivity was that people were suddenly cut off from all that collaborative um, systems that they had in the office and they were in this home alone situation where they had to reach an upskill for them so suddenly you no know, skilling happened so quickly uh, that the people started becoming more productive the other one is is this sustainable okay now a uh, very good point in terms of work life balance giving way to work life integration because we have a new house guest now all right and that house guest is the office and how well is that office going to integrate uh, with the home okay is uh, is a point to ponder but i don't see this as very sustainable okay I, that is because it is just not one person in the house doing this it is the children also who are probably connecting to their schools and things like that there are parents and grandparents who have their own things to do so getting everybody within that little uh, home or whatever you may call it you know little or huge is definitely a challenge okay and that throws us other questions right in terms of behaviors in terms of relationships so if you asked me um, the burnout is definitely going to happen we are already seeing signs of it where people are coming and saying hey can i come and work from the office you know people are, are saying that there is a portion uh, there is a section of people who who want to come and work in the office and then last but not least uh, it was your thing on productivity right in terms of productivity i have to one, once again say say here that uh, uh, people have found it a little bit challenging to initially get into it because see don't we have to look at this as as multi sectoral approach right the services industry very quickly went into uh, this work from home mode but there were other sectors who found it very difficult to cope all right so they are they are still struggling there is a lot of scope out here to tell people in terms of what is the mantra about working from home it's not just about going and connecting to your wifi and internet there are a lot of other things to do so i'll pause here and then take some more questions later on thank you sure sure thank you thank you augustus so so neeru coming from what ankita said and augustus said i'm going to throw at you a contra question uh, the contra question is based on actually very interesting uh, uh, article that came in um, uh, fortune uh, on, 20, on on the 14th of september and that talked about jp morgan so jp morgan went back and they did a study and they figured out that instead of uh, you know uh, what we talk about here in terms of productivity uh, increase uh, uh, they have found out that productivity actually went down after people started working from home and and interestingly they also figured out that the mondays and fridays were the worst days in terms of productivity right uh, today is a friday so i am i'm cognizant of that but but they actually found out that mondays and fridays actually were the worst and now starting 21st of september they are probably the first company uh, to make work from office mandatory because because these people really want now people to start working from their point of view then add to it uh, the ceo of netflix very recently he talked about uh, he was in yeah. news actually for the same reasons he talked about the fact that there is no ideation there is no creativity there is no collaboration there is no work happening when people are working from home and in fact some years back it was nothing about covid some years back google had advocated very clearly that you know we don't have a work from home policy there is a reason for it because we want people to collaborate the these results are actually in complete contradiction to that and of course uh, uh, 
so therefore my question to you is there are two distinct spectrum what's your view on exactly what is happening here which view is correct and 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 what do we believe so um it's it's very it's a very interesting question and especially the if you were you know the point in time in which we are looking at answering this question is also very interesting right so uh you know we are we probably i think in march we went into this pandemic it's been five months only and the biggest priority for when we went into that phase or organizations was you know transitioning you know making sure that you know the work gets managed and we transition so 100 percent focus was on getting the work done in a remote mode in a virtual manner and uh, i think that happened that's why you see the results on the first one that everybody is productive every uh, you know we did a very similar employee survey and asked the same question and you won't believe it though the results match 100 percent 90 percent i think it was 91 percent there also but you know the reason uh this reason why i said point in time because i think we are too early to really uh get to say that you know this is going to continue like this these levels of productivity or these levels of uh, uh so i think it's it's a uh, panchum it's it's a there's a there's a very interesting mckinsey study also which is really talking about in the long run how are organizations thinking of designing their uh, back to office strategy right is it is it a complete work from home versus a hybrid versus a you know a 100% office like jp morgan is doing because each of them are will be uh, right for certain contexts and each of those uh, would have their own pros and cons like a very interesting con that i never imagined was the biases that come into play between people who would work in office collaborate together ideate together versus those who 100% work from home right those social biases that can come into play uh, and that's what i think the netflix and you know the google piece refers to so so i in my view a hybrid is where uh, you know eventually companies will land up with giving uh, giving flexibility of uh, 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 you know to manage a future scenario but at the same time knowing that you know think of a, an it company which has a completely new uh, product to design for their customer you know 100 people team hired they really cannot like completely in a virtual way collaborate in the first three months you have to get them to office get to know each other so there will be phases of norming where you know you will have people in office i think that's where it'll be a in my view a hybrid based on the nature of the industry uh will be uh, what i think uh eventually work out for many uh and each will each of these models will have their own pros and cons but it's it's an interesting point in time that we are talking today well, thanks a lot, Neeru. Actually, you talked about something very interesting, and 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 that actually gave me a segue to uh, share with you a screen. Uh, now, this is a very interesting uh, research that actually was done by a company called Workalytics. So, this is a company that actually does analysis of work and pro peak productivity. Mm -hmm. So, what they talked about was very interesting. Uh, so, they said if if there is an eight-hour day, uh, uh, this is what they have seen as as uh, uh, as what happens to people. So they have figured that out of the eight hours, people are only at full productivity for two hours, 15 minutes on an average. There are so many distractions like email, chat, meetings, and so on and so forth, which actually do not in allow people to uh, work in a focused manner. And then if you see, almost one and a half hours is efficient use of time. So if you add this to the fact that people are finding the productivity has gone up and that actually hours also have gone up. So then it appears to me that unless we make some radical changes to the way we work, uh, we will not be able to sustain this, which is which is the yeah. point that all three of you have actually echoed. And 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 that is one thing that we, I think, as 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 HR professionals and as business managers, uh, we have to start thinking about more as we go along. Right. So on that note, uh, what what I thought we would actually uh, uh, also talk uh, talk about is the fact that all of us know that work will become more distributed as we go along. It will become more automated. This will require frequent reskilling and upskilling. The point that Augustus talked about, he talked about the fact that 20 to 30 percent learning, for example, has gone up. Uh, and we will have to focus on what we call intentional learning. That means we will have to continuously 
upgrade ourselves almost maybe add one skill every quarter to our repertoire if we want to continue to stay productive and relevant that's one the second thing that all of you talked about is unless i learn how to prioritize and how to look at what works for me in terms of increasing our productivity we will not be able to do much so on that note we transition from work to workplace so i'm just going to request people to come back to mentimeter and then we i will quickly share with you this is quite screen. interesting huh? <laughs> so attendees on mentimeter so attendees i request you to go to www.menti.com use the code 3022632 and answer the question so we'll wait for 25 to happen and then we'll uh, have a conversation around this so when i look at the word cloud it's interesting time management comes out as an interesting uh, big item so so panelists just for your benefit the bigger words are the ones that are being more used by people so we had given people at least three options that they can put three skills that they believe will become critical so it is very clear that agility adaptability time management they actually come up as the largest uh, in terms of number of people who believe um, will become uh, important as we go along so augustus uh, uh, so i'm throwing this question at you looking at agility adaptability time management how you think uh, would agility adaptability and time management will help people succeed in future in your mind or you have a different view maybe other skills or something yeah, um, well, I, I think my views are more or less aligned with the word cloud. And uh, if you see, uh, you know, we were all trained uh, with all these skills and competencies because we were trained for the perfect storm, right? And uh, we are now in the perfect storm. But except that, to drive home a point, we are in this storm, but in different boats. So what is happening here is that our learnings are a little bit within our own small boats okay so therefore to 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 drive home effective learning what we have done we, we are seeing this right um, we are driving heavy levels of collaboration and integration okay now apart from the marquee programs and learning programs that people do we are going into the businesses and seeing what are those specific skills and training programs that they require and we, what we are doing is we are curating what is called very consultative course content which is completely on our your learning platform your learning platform is like a netflix it's something that pushes things to you it knows you with cognitive ability what skills and competencies you have and what is it on the horizon as far as the organization's business plan goes and prepares people to take on those skills so that they are future skilled and finally, it also builds what is called COVID resilience, all right? In terms of what are those other things that you need to do? The mindfulness, the empathy, the uh, you know soft skills that are required, okay? All these things are also part of it. So I will stop there uh, and, uh, and leave it to the other panelists to take forward, thank you. Thank you, Augustus. You actually talked about a very interesting thing. You talked about empathy. Uh, and, and that is one thing that I would actually, uh, uh, you know, loop back at Niru. So Niru, uh, now when we talk about the future of workplace uh, being automated, uh, more digitized workplaces, more technologically connected workplaces, uh, where is the question of empathy that actually comes up and how? And, and, and how, why this becomes an important term? Because we keep reading about it everywhere uh, whenever we talk about future uh, skills and so on and so forth. So, um... So I think it's a it's a this whole softer aspect, you know, empathy of being at the heart of how you are making people experience the organization virtually, right? You know, it was easy to do that, relatively easier when you were physically present. Even if you were not talking, people would understand that you know uh, there is there is empathy. People are there. You know, now. Uh, I think this is again at the point in time we are as organizations as leaders 
it's it's a there's a big realization to be human you know when everything almost our environment is forcing us to literally you know go on an exponential speed on our digital journey uh there is a joke which is running around these days that it's not the ceo or the cto which is behind the digital transformation but it's covid right and yeah, and in that how do you really you know if, if there's a emotional part of the culture right that one has to uh, you know make sure that their new joiners experience that their employees experience all those experiences you know when you were giving a feedback when you were uh, you know exiting a person all of that how do you you know be more empathetic and how do you do that virtually it's a it's a, it's the lens that one has to wear on every process or everything and uh, again most important leadership skill right now is is you know really to be empathetic because rest of the things will happen you know resilience and empathy has to be at the heart of uh, you know how we are getting into this future mm-hmm. because eventually we'll get there you know it's about the how and you know how do you take your people along and make them experience your culture sitting at home interesting and that's a very interesting take so what i also wanted to do was to actually take another view on empathy uh, from employee experience design point of view uh, so ankita uh, uh, you know looking at post covid and looking at the future how things are going to be uh, if you can help us understand what what steps your organization has taken uh, to use empathy uh, to redesign the employee experience so that people don't feel that anything has changed as far as the experience of working in signex for example uh, has been sure so i think a lot of things have already changed and the first move is obviously to understand and tell them that things are not same and whatever is the changed mode we will still use it in the best possible manner to ensure that the experience and the culture remains intact so today when we talk about our employees we talk about four Uh, primary things uh, for which we connect so which is you know uh, connect or collaborate and communicate and contribute these are the four c's i think signex or any organization is working on and we have we have got into that mode where we are come you know counseling and training our leadership team before doing anything else because as we um, covered in our first question the intent is really important and leaders have to be ready to adapt explore and stay relevant that's the only way where they'll be able to understand the market outside and at the same time they'll be able to help internal employees um so you know we have we have come up with a lot of processes where the core is that you don't have to wait till the things get broken you know you don't have to fix it when it's broken you you have to start fixing it even if it's not broken so all those remodels that we talk about these days you know as we discussed every single day is changing so you have to be ready to relearn reevaluate restructure i'm sure whatever policies and processes we came up with in the month of march we thought this will remain as is throughout covid era but by may we were again back to our boards and we were revisiting anything and everything that we defined again if we talk about today probably whatever was defined in the month of march or may even that is changing so that's the approach we have uh, taken to keep revisiting and adapting as per the market need and as per the employees need and empathy as uh, neeru mentioned that becomes the core because when you are understanding people when you are listening to them when you are respecting their time and their integration their balance which they are trying to manage at work and still they are trying to contribute to your business model that has to be brought together as a model and that's the reason probably we initiated a um, couple of uh, activities which is lead generally the moment culture changes we expect the junior most people to adapt you know the first line from management would be yes things have changed we have enabled you please accept and start doing it so our lead is where leaders change e is enablers and executives and then the departments similarly is a uh, care where communicate adapt respond and empathize so like augustus mentioned and neeru mentioned we have moved technical technical skills everybody is taking care of we have moved to 
more softer and people skills where we have under, understood first internally within management and leadership team why it is important to hold back to employees to understand them keep them safe and uh, you know be little um, clear be authentic first once the comfort is built internally no matter how well or how soon situations are changing people will adapt and they'll they'll be always part of a successful business model in fact you you brought out a very interesting point and, and in fact i'm just now going to uh, 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 try and uh, see, uh, uh, you know, weave ideas that uh, Augustus, uh, Niru, and Ankita you talked about. In fact, uh, uh, recently on Netflix, there is a new documentary that has come in. It's um, uh, it's about how um, the social dilemma is the name of the documentary, and it talks about how uh, how empathy is being used uh, to yeah. to get people to hook on to their systems. For example, it talks about Facebook, Twitter. Uh, 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 Insta, uh, uh, Pinterest, and so on and so forth. And these are people who are talking about the fact that each one of these people, these people who are coders, they all went to Stanford Persuasion Labs, where they were taught what, how to influence people by understanding them. Similarly, when you look at design thinking, the first step is actually empathize. So, so, so yes, you're absolutely right that unless I understand who I'm designing the processes for. I will not be able to do anything, and and I think I think one of the questions that has come up uh, is that in future technology is set to take over many cognitive jobs, leaving organizations perplexed. What's our view about technology conquering human jobs? I think the answers that you gave very clearly say that technology will not technology will not take over human job. Human job will be to be, uh, will be to understand more about other humans and use technology to create experiences so that people are able to perform better so which is exactly what you have actually uh, spoken about so another interesting question augustus since you talked about the fact that you know 20 to 30 percent learning has increased uh, in the last five and a half months and you also talked about your learning uh, as, as a netflix of learning so a question from audiences uh, uh, is how skill building of for future skill can be used to catch up with the rate of technological change so so what are you doing about it uh, in your organization uh, to make sure that people are skilled at the pace the technology is changing or maybe faster than that for that matter i think the cognitive the cognitive ability that is built into the tool you know which is from your learning okay and uh, so what happens here is that uh, people have a specific number of hours that they need to complete and then there is a commitment from a skilling perspective you know in terms of do i want to become a full stack person or am i going to stay at half stack or whatever the case may be and then uh, with today's you know a uh, perfect form situation with people being in different boats what is happening again is that uh, each requirement so ibm is a conglomerate of like different companies within okay so therefore each business unit has unique set of skills uh, that it requires so therefore a lot of consultative learning happens here in terms of it's not like a all uh, one size fits all but consultative learning and then skill building here if you look at it uh, we go even beyond ibm to do the skill building now whether it is with the national skill development council that uh, the government of india set up or uh, skilling you know uh, the colleges the faculty and the academy out there so that we get the right skills so we have a program called ignite you know reignite reignite is basically at those academicians to bring them up to speed as to where the technology is going. So that academia and industry to some extent are bridging that gap and it's also a bit synchronized. But typically as far as the employee goes, uh, he or she today has a very deep push factor. You know, earlier, uh, sorry, pull factor. Earlier there was a push factor. The managers will have to push people into learning rooms, right? But today it's not like that. There is a pull factor because of the high level of digitization that has happened and the interactive learning and like what i said a cognitive digital learning platform 
okay, that pushes things to them and gives them feedback on and on. So all these things have, to a very large extent, enabled us to have a, a very skilled workforce, uh, which is very future ready. Thanks. Well, interesting, in, uh, Augustus. So in fact, uh, while you were actually uh, talking about reskilling, you were talking about industry academia. I also, uh, what I'm doing is I'm actually sharing a quick uh, uh, poll with the audiences, and then we will come back to Ankita and Niru to look at what they're actually talking about. Yeah. So, so audiences, my request to you would be to come to come back to Mentimeter for a minute, and and since you actually talked about skilling for future. Uh, uh, I thought, you know, we will actually ask people how prepared their organizations are in terms of understanding what new skills are required, number one, and number two, to what extent are they actually starting reskilling uh, uh, and, and upskilling interventions already. So audience, my request again would be for you to log into menti.com, use the same meeting code 3022632. In case you have not moved out of Menti, then of course you can continue to vote. I can see that people have now started moving. So let's see what, what it says. Yeah, so it's actually interesting. So majority still says that they have started new skills, which is which is which is interesting. So while we keep looking at the poll, so Ankita Niru, uh, the, my, my question to you, building on what Augustus said, was that uh, do you also have education, uh, corporate partnerships or academia corporate partnerships uh, for, for skilling your people in, in specific skills? Yes, so um, I think nobody can do without it, uh, looking at the current situation or scenario. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, so we do have, we have uh, internal tool and that also focuses on, you know, futuristic learning or how to be future ready. And as uh, Augustus mentioned, you know, again, um, it is more proactive um, instead of, um, you know, being at the repairing stages, it's more of a preparing stage. And I can see the numbers uh, going up to what 62% uh, of people say yes. Correct. And I think, yeah. uh, uh, organizations have realized they have that intent and I think we all had resources we have all had people we had capabilities and abilities to plan and execute we all had time only possible thing missing was intent we always knew future is not, future is going to be uh, too dramatic uh, too unpredictable but we were still not uh, there now organizations are much more conscious with respect to which are those technical skills those would be required in coming future and at the same time what level of focus they want to give uh, to virtual skills because obviously virtual being the new real today be it cognitive skills social and people skills emotional skills and the real skills that i spoke about so yes, we have this a system which is deep digital employee engagement platform, and that's where uh, we have our uh, development tool um, uh, enabled, and that's primarily used for all the future ready training transformations. Interesting, Ankita. Thanks a lot. So Niru, uh, uh, yeah. what has Global Logic uh, uh, done to create these academia corporate partnerships? So I'll, I'll come to Academia Corporate, uh, you know, and uh, so on the Academia Corporate side, uh, you know, we do, of course, you know, we are, we are a technology organization and uh, we want to get early into the game, you know, so with the, with the, you know, with the engineering colleges whom where we, where we, you know, definitely get our uh, young talent from, we, we start our engagement much ahead of the time every year. So we do have a platform where the whole, uh, you know their campus to corporate journey begins almost 12 to 14 weeks before they join and mm -hmm. we we have this whole program which is very very well defined with milestones where they get mentored by our techies you know our really uh, yeah. uh and uh we we enable a lot of webinars for them so there is this whole interaction which is going on uh and by the time they join we pretty much know them you know uh, on a from a uh, perspective of uh, you know uh, who is a specialist in which area you know uh, can we can what percentage of people can directly go on to what kind of transformational programs so a lot of work happens before they their day one at global logic right so, so, so that's 
yeah so that is one part uh, of the whole journey with you know with the academia the other part is uh, you know it's it's the career paths or you know it starts with the role and the learning interventions or learning journey is very very carved out let's say you're a software engineer uh, in in the you join as a software engineer and the path you know as you get you know uh, into your lead role or you know you become a sme at there you know later so what are what are the kind of learning interventions that are designed along that path one is that you know whatever role you are playing role aligned learning the other part is the academies what we very very proactively do is run academies which are very very focused on future capabilities and skills so at this time for example we have a digital academy we have a architect academy we have data engineering academy and these academies are are really run by our smes with lnd becoming the curators and facilitators or co-program designers with them and we you know these are this is almost like continuously investing into the future uh, kind of programs and uh, for an organization what you talk, so what you talked about is actually very interesting because if you see see one of some of these things very interestingly were done by um, companies like google for who had for example uh, uh, hal varian as as one of the uh, advisors in the uh, people analytics piece hal varian actually is a noted economist and uh, in fact uh, undergraduate textbooks on economics most likely would be written by him Mac microeconomics mm -hmm. and macroeconomics books hal varian is the guy who normally writes it and he actually works with google on on solving some of the business problems similarly uh, richard taylor who pioneered the idea of uh, behavioral economy using his book called uh, uh, what was the name uh, it talked about nudge uh, uh, the the book was misbehaving misbehaving was the book that he talked about where he talks about the fact that humans are not rational hum uh, we are not robots uh, and yeah. therefore we, we will we are irrational in our behavior uh, before that dan aerially so google actually were able to uh, they were they were able to get these people to work with them on solving some real time problems and that has also shown in their success and and increasingly i see that you know more and more uh, masters of research program people are now coming and doing research in corporates which is a very heartening thing and i hope that it continues because because i think when when when, when we need a sound conceptual framework there is no better rigor than an academic institution that can provide yeah. So, so, yeah. so, so that that actually is very interesting. Well, thanks a lot for that. So now, see another interesting thing when we talk about a workplace of future. One is of course learning on demand, which Augustus you <laughs> talked about at Netflix. The other interesting uh, interesting change that is hap happening is talent on demand. So learning yeah. on demand is for essential employees, but the whole definition of employee also is undergoing change, and therefore. It, it'll be interesting for us to actually look at again audiences. So audiences, I will request you to go back to Mentimeter and I'm going to put the next poll. So one concept that people have been talking about is talent marketplace, which is now increasingly becoming popular in, in, in India as well. Of course, it was very popular uh, abroad, like uh, Upwork, for example, made it very popular in the US. Uh, in India, you have a company called Flexing It, for example. Yeah. Um, uh, for creative Fiber. people, there is something called Fiber. Uh, for Fiber now, Noble House has started doing something like that. So I want to know from audiences, audiences in your organization, to what extent are you guys actually using uh, some of these talent marketplaces? And then I will defer the question to panelists, depending on the responses that we get, to look at what the future of talent would look like, not only learning but the the talent uh, or the skills or, or or the concept of full-time employee as we talk about so let's take uh, the next one minute because that will be this will be the last question that i'm going to uh, throw at the panelists before we bind up so so far the results are actually fairly skewed to not at all uh, to limited use okay the trend is clear so while of course we wait for more and more people to talk about this uh, so so uh, so panelists, uh, the, the question to you, of course, um, uh, is uh, talent marketplace platforms like Plexing It, Upwork and Fiverr. Now going forward, when we talk about gig talent, and this is, there is actually a question on this also. So in fact, I'm going to use that question to frame my question. So people are actually talking about what are your views on gig work or remote work models? The fact is that 
uh, I think I think uh, uh, we all know that remote work is is a reality, no longer a dream. Number one. Number two, there are companies like Automatic and Miro, which are 100% distributed, not a single office, uh, and they are billion-dollar-plus enterprises. That's the beauty, and it's consistently successful. On on one hand, you have organizations like that. On the other hand, you have platforms like this, which is uh, again picking up in India also to some extent. But the fact is, if you look at the survey results, it tells you that it is not yet as popular as the potential it produces. And therefore, my question, uh, uh, so to Dr. Ankita, let me start with you. So the question is, how are you using the talent marketplace or the gig model uh, in your talent mix uh, uh, to prepare for future? To what extent are you looking at this as a uh, as a as a as a plausible model uh, for 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 future talent requirements? Sure, I think uh, if we talk about today uh, probably yes the percentage is very low but when we talk about future and um, you know definitely by 2030 if we see the percentage of uh, gig workers or boundaryless organizations or boundaryless uh, employees is is definitely going to uh, increase exponentially so as I think uh, Niru initially mentioned and um, Augustus as well, it's, as well, it's going to be a hybrid model. So we cannot generalize it. Um, every company will decide, uh, create that right mix, probably more uh, on the basis of project-based requirement. But but that's the future. It is it is going to expand exponentially. If a company is saying that no, this is not the model we will get into, probably. I would just say never say never because I think we all were so sure that we will never start working from home and it was a new thing nobody was exploring and today people are actually thinking what percentage of employees should go back to work so things have drastically changed and they'll keep changing uh, with respect to my organization I think we have already moved to a model where we have these small um, duration projects for three months or six months and where client expectation is such no organization would want to take that bench cost or probably would want to make that employee sit in the organization and unnecessarily spend on cross training even if you are a little clearer about the future so yes i think uh, that's one place where we are using it extensively and uh, and i'm sure if at all i look at the um, percentage increase in my organization in last one year I have already seen it from 10 to 40 percent and it oh. is it is further growing we are still exploring more as far as our PS which is professional services we have actually created a group separate group for that looking at the model and how beneficial it is and also you you have more options you you can change your talent instead of investing more in the uh, current ones you can actually get ready people from the market place them on projects and once the project is done you are done with the uh, model so yes i think that's the future so that's actually a very interesting insight so so neeru uh, uh, what about uh, your organization are you using a uh, gig as a model extensively or are you still nascent and any plans to do it in future in future is obviously you know we are actually looking at and then this is in fact just before we went into the lockdown we were having some discussions on workforce modeling and and evaluating some of the work that we can potentially give to people on these platforms pretty much what you mentioned so those were the discussions that are going on and i i'm very sure that it will actually be a competitive advantage a very definite competitive advantage in future as well so um yeah, right now I think the percentage is less, but it is there. Uh, futuristically, this is going to go up. Interesting. Augustus, your take on how IBM is going to uh, leverage the gig model or the talent marketplace model and how you have been doing it in the past? Let me take a leaf out of my book, um, you know, yet we published, uh, where we, we talk about the workforces or workplaces resembling a movie production unit. Now what happens in a movie production unit, right? You have a script and then you have a producer, director, and then you go and get a talent, whether it's the dancers, heroes, heroines, musicians, cameramen, and all of them. And these are all professionals in their own right. They are someplace, somewhere. 
a common objective brings them all together. And then they understand that vision and then go come together, collaborate, finish the movie. And then what happens is that they box it and then it goes up. So if the movie clicks, you know, box office, they get paid for what they did, plus they get a royalty. So compensation okay. model will also change. Okay. Well, if it doesn't click, if it bombs, all right, it's an issue of reputation. So therefore, therefore, it's so important to be so connected and networked and have those endorsements. All right. So that is where the, the future of people, workplaces, and the ways of working, what we call is the new ways of working is definitely in. As far as um, I think goes, I'm sorry, I won't be able to comment on it. It's still very nascent, but uh, overall, this is, this is the trend. This is also a projection or a prediction to, so to say, of what the future will be. Thank you. In fact, thanks a lot, Ankita, Augustus and Niru. This is actually interesting insight that you gave that, that it's starting slow but but we we believe it's going to accelerate number one this will create a really actually we'll have to have a separate team uh hr team to manage this entire contingent workforce including their learning their assimilation and in fact uh, maybe for the first time the the team stages of you know forming norming storm forming storming norming performing and adjourning will actually start coming into play because unless you have project teams uh, consistently adjourning you will not have newer ones getting created. And I think that's going to certainly happen as we go along. We will have holacracies instead of hierarchy. Panchi, I'm sorry. Sorry, I, I can't pull this back to interrupt you. So the thing here, you, while you said the HR teams, it's about the HR teams adapting. It's all about a mindset change. I see the business will take this very quickly because the business is now seeing a very clear cost efficient model here. You know, your okay. labor costs are down. Okay. So, which means now that the shift has, has to happen with HR. And if you go and tell the business, man, look, you're going to save so many uh, million dollars, you got it. Okay? Correct. Yeah. And in any case, since people are saying that productivity has gone up, <laughs> in any case, people will be lapping onto this. You are now more productive, so we need less people. And whoever we need, we can get on demand to meet the seasonal requirements. So yes, some of these things, you are right, will have far reaching impact on how things pan out. So let me just take the next one minute quickly to summarize what we covered here. And then uh, we will just quickly uh, close the uh, session. So uh, what we talked about today is how work will evolve is that this will become more distributed. This will become more automated. This will require frequent reskilling, upskilling. This will require all of us to consistently create a repertoire of skills for for that for us to become not only specialists but full stack employees as augustus uh, talked about how work will change we all know that workplaces will become more distributed because work is becoming distributed in fact workplaces will become close to the consumer which you would have already seen now actually more and more supply chains are becoming smaller and the whole world is facing the issue that China has created, for example, the entire world's manufacturing was was concentrated there. Now people are thinking about alternative places where they can manufacturing, including India. We talk about Art Nirbhar, Make yeah. in India. And you, you all know that this is actually going to happen uh, because your supply, your, your, your transportation lines will be disrupted and you have no other choice. The workplace will become automated. It will become more flexible. It will become a compulsory to learn and relearn and unlearn. It will become more collaborative using technology and it will become a continuum. So there is no concept of full time employee versus not a full time employee going forward. Going forward, it will be about talent on demand an essential employee. When you need someone to do the core job and, and maybe act as an aggregator and talent on demand from outside the organization, it could be academia, it could be specialists, it could be contractors to make sure that my work is delivered. And what is important, which we talked about, is how we will have to also uh, start looking at ourselves as individuals is that we have to start learning to become operational in fully digital environments with minimum physical uh, proximity with our colleagues. We have to ensure that our cognitive skills 
are developed to ensure constant innovation design at the speed of consumer or faster in some cases for example covid is an example so that means it doesn't matter which profession i am in i have to learn project management i have to learn problem solving i have to be ideation i have to know ideation i have to know design thinking and more importantly we are going to talk about the fact that more and more people will need social and emotional skills to ensure we remain sane we are able to collaborate with others and we are able to help our teams navigate better in fact interestingly ceo of uh, uh, infosys talked about it he says that you know in our hiring mix in infosys we are going to hire more people with humanities background and and there is no bigger testament to this than this that you know going forward you will need people with high resilience social and emotional resilience if you really have to continuously succeed and last but not the least we have been talking about this people who cannot constantly upgrade themselves will find themselves outside the job market with that thought i conclude this webinar what i want to do is thank the three speakers dr ankita augustus and neeru for their time for their insights i i really enjoyed the conversation i hope uh, 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 that others also were able to get a lot from their insights into their organizations and what they have seen around them and i'm hoping that going when we go out from there at least we will have taken one thing that we can start implementing tomorrow onwards thank you thank, thank you pancham thank you pancham very well moderated thank you good question thanks, thanks a lot thank you augustus so, thank you neeru and dakka thanks augustus thanks neeru thanks pancham very interactive and very engaging we thoroughly enjoyed thank you so much yeah. thanks a lot yeah.